we just saw were the title cards for the 1934 film by Dziga Vertov, Three Songs About Lenin. It was the last work Vertov could call his own, and by the time he died in 1954, he was very disliked by the remainder of people who knew his name. Much of this disdain is thought to have happened uh, due to Vertov's neglect of Stalin in Three Songs About Lenin. But who exactly was Dziga Vertov? The year was 1896, January 2nd, when Denis Arkadievich Kaufman was born in Bielostok, Poland, or what is now Poland. Germany invaded Poland early on in his life, and so he consequently spent uh, most of his life and all of his career in Russia. He lived through various wars and saw changes of government several times uh, throughout his life. Um, so it goes without saying that his work was shaped by what he experienced. He founded a group called Kinok, or the Kinok Group, in 1919, which first published a, a, a version of the manifesto that we have in our textbook, or our 100, 100 Manifestos book, uh, called We, in the, okay, so in the 1922, in the 1922 journal called Kinofot 1, um, We was first published. We, the manifesto We, had its origins in 1919, just a couple years after the Bolsheviks took power. So Russia at the time was experiencing uh, many reformations, including to the education system and to the powers of the state, which were eventually made absolute. And at this time, at the time he was writing the manifesto, uh, Lenin would have been in power. And uh, he idolized Lenin. And, and at this time, there was also a huge ups, upswing of industrialization. And so uh, factories and stuff were becoming way more relevant, uh, but this was not unique to Russia or to communism. Following the rise of industrialization, uh, we can see that Veritov was also obsessed with the perfection of machinery and the perfection that machinery bought, brought to the work environment. And he, so he thought it had a form of poetry about it that he wanted to glorify within the cinema. Ziga Vertov's main motivations for writing this manifesto were that he wanted people to feel the world. He wanted to make a representation of reality. He wanted the people who were watching the movie to see reality. And so he was very critical of... Um, foreign films, including American, British, French, and Japanese films, uh, because they possessed many fantastical qualities. He, he believed the suffering that people experienced in those movies was not very well translated from the suffering that people experience in reality. So his goal was to tell the truth about what was happening in Russia. But that said, a lot of his work is and was really reflective of what the government wanted movies to say about everyday life. And his work changed when leaders changed, though as our book suggests, um, after Lenin died and Stalin took power, Vertov was effectively thrown under the rug, brushed under the rug, and um, he wasn't allowed to make any work that he wanted to, and so the stuff that he did come out with may not have been a, a, a very accurate representation of what he actually thought. Okay, now I'm going to read a bit from the manifesto to really solidify what I already described about said manifesto and the things that it's claiming. So it starts with the rejection of foreign films. So it says... We consider the psychological Russo-German film drama weighed down with apparitions and childhood memories an absurdity. 
to the American adventure film with its showy dynamism, and to the dramatizations of the American Pinkertons, the Kinooks say thanks for the rapid shot changes and the close-ups. Good, but disorderly. Not based on a precise study of movement. A cut above the psychological drama, but still lacking in foundation. A cliché, a copy of a copy. So, Americans have something... There's something that they have of quality with the adventure film, but overall, uh, no foundation in reality. And as we'll see later, uh, there's this postmodern idea here of a copy of a copy. So then it goes on to reject old films as well, largely because they're also fantastical. Uh, It says, we proclaim the old films based on the romance, theatrical films, and the like, to be leprous. Keep away from them. Keep your eyes off them. They are mortally dangerous, contagious. We affirm the future of cinema art by denying its present. Cinematography must die so that the art of cinema may live. We call for its death to be hastened. And then it goes on to really emphasize how much reality matters to this movement. So it says, we are cleansing Kinochestvo of foreign matter, of music, literature, and theater. We seek our own rhythm, one lifted from nowhere else, and we find it in the movements of things. We invite you to flee out into the open, into four dimensions, the three plus time, in search of our own material, our meter, and rhythm. So there's this really strong feeling that uh, everything has to have this foundation in reality and um, the the movies of the time to them are not satisfying this requirement and so they reject everything else that's not real and uh, try to create a cinema that is real and we'll see that in the examples that I'm about to show. So at the end of the manifesto, they talk about how the machine is this perfection. It's this idea of um, really calculated movements. And they talk about how man's movements are really clumsy and ineffective. And so it says, for his inability to control his movements, we temporarily exclude man as a subject for film. Our path leads through the poetry of machines, from the bungling citizen to the perfect electric man. And so there's this idea of perfection and of calculation and rhythm. It talks about the rhythm of machines, too. It says, openly recognizing the rhythm of machines, the delight of mechanical labor, the perception of the beauty of chemical processes. We sing of earthquakes. We compose film epics of electrical power plants and flame. We delight in the movements of comets and meteors and the gestures of searchlights that dazzle the stars. It also suggests that cinema is the art of uh, planning. And that sort of goes along with their idea of the machine as the perfect man. Um, They say they want to exclude man temporarily from cinema um, because man is imperfect and and the machine, the machine is, it is perfect. It's calculated and, and everything like that. Um, and so in a sense, they demonstrate their plans to make mankind this perfect calculated subject. And it says in relation to what cinema is, it says cinema is drawings in motion, blueprints in motion, plans for the future, the theory of relativity on screen. I'm going to show some clips from Beratov's Man with a Movie Camera from 1929. It is a silent film, and a huge part of me wants to just show the film and not talk over it, but I think for time, for the sake of time, I'm going to talk over the film, so you'll have to forgive me for that. Um, but... As we get going here, I just want to make note of the title cards. Uh, They are really indicative of 
of what the goal of this movie was, and it's totally in line with the manifesto. So it's all in Russian, but there's the there are the subtitles, and I'll just let you read them. But they basically say, you know, we're going to focus on reality. Uh, there's not going to be a narrative here. It's just going to be pictures of real people and real things doing real activities, um, and that's it. First thing to note in any movie, really, is the opening shot. And the opening shot is in this movie is also very important. You'll notice it opened on this uh, picture of a camera. And the camera greatly outshines the person in the frame. And even though this movie is called A Man with a Movie Camera, it doesn't seem at least in these opening shots, to be the man that is the focus of the film, but rather the camera. And I, I want to pay close attention to these shots here uh, because there's a lot of back and forth. It'll show one thing, and then it'll cut to another thing, and then it'll cut back to the other thing, the first thing. And there's a lot of, there's a lot of rhythm in that. And that's also really important, as we saw in the manifestos. You'll see the mechanical chairs fold down. No human contact. No, There's no inability for man to mess up their movements. All the chairs fold down at the same time. And it's just, it's all very organized and orderly. Note too, this this sequence here with the orchestra, the orchestra is inherently rhythmic. It's a very rhythmic activity uh, that centers around, you know, doing things perfectly in time. And again, that rhythm and machinery is just very important. It's not even, in these shots, it's not even really the people who are the subjects. It's the instruments. It's what the instruments are doing that's important and not necessarily the people doing them. So that's the end of the first section, or the lead-up to the first section. The rest of it is much the same. It just shows people going about their daily business. There are people sleeping. There are people getting dressed. There are people going to work. Um, there's a huge focus on machinery, as I talked about already. There's trains and cars moving in the streets. Uh, it follows, of course, the cameraman. And his camera, but again, it's largely about the reality that the camera can capture and not about uh, the capturing of that reality. Anyway, the film is public domain. It's on YouTube. It's on the Internet Archive. You can watch it for free, and I urge you to. For the next section of this presentation, I'm going to be looking at uh, Stan Brackage. So Stan was born in 1933 in Missouri, in Kansas City, uh, but when he was six, he moved to 
uh, Denver, Colorado, where he was introduced to the arts at a very early age. He graduated from high school and got a scholarship to Dartmouth, but left after one semester to pursue the arts and uh, returned to Denver to make his first film in 1952. Uh, Throughout the course of his life, he made over 350 movies, uh, which were all super unique, sometimes only a few minutes long. Um, And he lived, you know, during a time that was heavily influenced by uh, existentialism and postmodern philosophy and, of course, phenomenology. And then he died pretty recently uh, in March of 2003. Brackage was really motivated by his desire to break these laws, these man-made laws or notions of perception. And so, like Veritov, Brackage uh, produces cinema that almost never has a narrative and almost never has sound. He's focused purely on vision and what you see with your eye, he thinks, is something that... uh, is often neglected and is something that should be trained more. In the manifesto, he imagines, or he asks the audience to imagine an eye, and I'll just read it, I guess. He asks the audience, imagine an eye unruled by man-made laws of perspective, an eye unprejudiced by compositional logic, an eye which does not respond to the name of everything, but which must know each object encountered in life through an adventure of perception. So he talks about how uh, children learn early on to put labels on the things that they see. And um, he wants to transcend those labels and make every vision a adventure as he says an adventure of perception i also i also said that he wants the art of vision the art the art of seeing to be trained more he talks about he says um yet i suggest that there is a pursuit of knowledge foreign to language and founded upon visual communication demanding the development of the optical mind and dependent upon perception in the original and deepest sense of the word. He talks about how art throughout time has been the sustainment of uh, visual understanding and perception, uh, but how not many artists who are creating film at this time are... are, uh, really capturing the the beauty or the intricacies of what vision can really be. And so his art is very visual and visually oriented. Given that this manifesto was written in 1963, I found a movie from Brackage, also from 1963, Uh, since I figured it would be closest to what he was thinking at that time. Um, So I'm going to show the whole thing in in its entirety. It's like three minutes and some change. So it's a silent film. You'll just have to pay attention to the visuals. Do note that it was not made with a camera. It's just a film strip in which he has glued moth wings to it and made scratches on the film and so it's in that sense very experimental and it doesn't have a narrative as you would expect from his manifesto Um, but I don't know try and 
think about how it makes you feel watching it and what exactly you're looking at. Think of it as, to use his words, as an adventure in perception. It's called Moth Light. Dogma 95 is the next film movement I'll talk about. It was founded in 1995 by two Danish filmmakers, Lars von Trier and Thomas Vinterberg, who were born in 1956 and 1969, respectively. Uh, their motivations were really to just return to the traditional values of film, they rejected big productions that were happening specifically in Hollywood around the time that they published their manifesto. So they wanted to go against the practice of genre films, which is incidentally why they disbanded in 2002, because they realized that the films they were making were largely formulaic and genre films in and of themselves. So they disbanded. And also ironically, uh, they wanted to, so they wanted to go against the practice of of the of genre films, but they're very derivative of other filmmakers like Carl Dreyer, David Lynch, and you'll see a lot of similarities 
from their stuff with uh, Vertov, the first, the subject of the first part of this presentation. Um, and Carl Dreyer and Trier actually have some interesting life parallels. They're both born because of extramarital affairs and both, in a sense, rejected by their biological fathers. Dreyer was raised by an adopted family, and when Trier met his father later in life, his father wanted nothing to do with him. So they created this manifesto, which contains ten rules called the Vows of Chastity. And the idea was to spur creativity by creating strict rules for a director to work within. They thought that by creating this strict construct, it would force the directors to use their imagination within the construct, that the, the filmmakers would then have something to bounce off and bend and uh, do with what they will, as opposed to if you have nothing, it's harder to be creative. At least that's what they thought. Um, so there are the 10 rules, but I don't know why I should share them with you when I can just let Trier talk about his movement himself. So I'll show this next clip. It's a 10 minute documentary called Lars from one to 10 and uh, Lars von Trier talks about his experience within the dogma movement and its intercut with the uh, rules outlined in the manifesto. It's a little strange. Uh, just as a warning, there are some there are some nudity, uh, both male and female, so if you're uncomfortable with that, I would just skip 10 minutes ahead. <laughs> All I know about Lars von Trier is his name. You don't know any of his films? No. You've never seen any of his films? No, never. How do you know his name? Well, it's always in the papers. Why? Because he's a movie maker. Well, the idea was to set down a set of rules for filming. I would say that any good director has some rules, but he just does do not write them down. If you have some limitations when you work, like these rules or like other things, then uh, you, you are forced kind of to use your imagination. These rules could be any rules, right? The whole idea is that there are some rules. And we put down these 10, and there are 10. That's not so good. Should have been nine or <laughs> five or something. It could have been different, or, but, but the idea was to say, these are the rules, let's work from them. Then we can make some others, or we can, we can work without rules, but let's try that. It's, it's an, uh, we were doing an effort to see what was happening if, we, if you follow some rules. The dogma rules are very much made for me, in the sense that, uh, but that's maybe more personal, but I, we talked about this, you know, having control or giving away control. And all these rules are designed for me to give away control. Part of the idea of the dark thing was, of course, to get down to this basic feeling of film. It's provocative in the sense that you have this idea of, especially in Europe, that of being an artist as being completely free. And that this is part of being an artist, is being completely free. And that is what the whole idea of dogma is arguing. It's been very important to me how the colors of the film look. And then of course it's a great relief to have a rule saying it's color film, you can't do anything about it. So they're designed for me, if you see all the rules, they're kind of more or less designed for me not to do what I thought I've been doing for a long time. 
orders to myself, like in hypnotism, you know, don't use artificial light. <laughs> no, no, I won't. With the dogma rules, that is what you do. You give away control. But then again, if you can't control it all, what's the point? After making Breaking the Wave, everybody wants to see Breaking the Wave 2 done as the next film. But that is... Uh, I, I, I can't do that and I don't want to do that. Because, it's, um, because I want to go on. And, and that's why it's important for me to make a film like The Idiots now. And, and then, you know, if people don't like it, they... <laughs> I, I, I couldn't care less. In the beginning of my career, I was I was not giving any freedom at all to the actors. They were more or less like props. And uh, now, in this period of my life, I think it's very interesting to have a cooperation. I uh, insisted that we were naked all the time in the beginning. That was great. That was kind of kind of in the 60s, 70s. That was wonderful. They were so tired in the in the end of seeing me naked. Put on some clothes. I think. <laughs> But I think it helped them anyway, because I think some of the nude scenes are quite relaxed. All of the actors cried every day, but the actors loved that. And then, you know, then the director should go in and say, I feel sorry for you. That really sounds bad. Oh yes, it's I'm. Uh, you know, my father didn't understand me. Yes, it, you must be terribly angry at him, aren't you? Yes, I'm. Uh, you know all these. It's very beautiful, wonderful. I paid a lot of money to learn these things. <laughs> I've been in therapy. I don't know how long. <laughs> but a lot of crying. Boys were crying also. Do you wish that someone would take you in hand and and sort of do to you what you did to them, to the actors? Is there a part of you that wants to be sort of unleashed in this way and made to cry and <laughs> Yes, please. <laughs> no, you're not offering it, okay. Yes, I'm sure. And spanked also, please. Yes. Yes, that would be wonderful. Yes, uh, sorry. <laughs> the Kingdom is a good example of what ideas I like to uh, to, uh, to to use because it's it's in a, in a form where it's 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 uh, it, we haven't censored very much when we wrote the script. Oh, the, some of the other films has, have been censored much more, and you know the script has been taking years to write. This was much faster, and this is we, we haven't taken anything away because it's bad taste or because it doesn't fit there. It was just kind of all of our ideas and dreams or whatever just came into the script. So uh, you can say that when you're afraid of something, then there is also some kind of a fascination around the subject. Otherwise, you know, other not, otherwise, why bother being afraid of something? Yeah, I'm extremely afraid of hospitals. That the hospital is kind of the symbol of your lack of power over yourself, over your body. All my anxieties you will find in the films. I will force my actors to do what I'm afraid of. I was so afraid of having cancer, I don't remember, I think it was in my... I don't remember where the cancer was, but anyway, I, I met, went, went to this doctor and he said, you should make a fantasy trip. As now he was not a real doctor, he was kind of a man who did this. And I said, that sounds ridiculous, you know. And then I did it and it was a lot of fun. It was such a lot of fun. And I went down into the, to the molecules of my body, right? And I went into the, to this enormous area where there was a lot of, uh, 
coffins. No, it's kind of the chests, you know, with the, that you normally have gold in, what do you call it, treasure chests or whatever. And there was a million of them. And on, on top of each of them, there was a tiger lying with a trifork. <laughs> it's fantastic. And I laughed such a lot while I, while I did it. It was really fantastic. And then uh, down in the chest were, you know, the genetic material. That was kind of the whole idea. And then this tiger was kind of guarding it. It was beautiful. And I talked to the tiger. It was great. Oh, I hand him over. Oh, but I'm, I'm, I'm meditating a lot. I'm very, I'm very close to, you know, these, these things. Also, when I do this shamanistic thing, it's more or less the same. It's, I'm really having fun with it. It's beautiful. It's just kind of click and then you're... But it all has to do with the universe within yourself is much more interesting than, you know, the one around us. Well, this is my... This is where I lived when I was a child. And uh, I've been trying to get away from this place for a long time, for 30 years, no, for 40 years. <laughs> and uh, now I bought the house back and now I know that I will never get away. So, uh, and the children are crying as you can hear. Great. It's a good sign, it tells a parent that they are alive. I'll let the credits of this video play out, but I'll mute them so I can talk over it. Uh, but as you can plainly see in that video, these dogma filmmakers were very, very reminiscent of Vertov and that film movement. I mean, they were both super concerned with uh, reality and the rules themselves are very reality based and they're not allowed to do much editing and no fake action, no superficial action, it says. Um, and everything has to be really original. No, no making a movie or following a guideline or a genre, as it were. So the documentary footage had some of the dogma films in, intercut in between uh, Lars talking, but to better uh, demonstrate the dogma style and the, what the dogma cinema looked like, I'm going to use the first couple scenes from a movie called Breaking the Waves, which is from 1996. It's the first movie that Lars came out with after releasing the manifesto. Ironically enough, though, it does not actually follow the dogma rules. It breaks a ton of them. So there's studio sets, there's music, there are computer graphics, and within the first two scenes, uh, I can demonstrate all of those breaks. But at the same time, I can show, you know, how they tried to capture this overall feeling. And there is only one movie that really follows that there's only one official dogma movie it's called the idiots from 1998 but that movie is seemingly not available anywhere and i cannot find it for the life of me so i'll be showing this one and we'll just have to understand that it's not truly dogma though it does of course have some dogma aspects which i'll try and point out to the best of my ability His name is Jan. I do not know him. He is from the Rick. You know we do not favor matrimony with outsiders. Can you even tell us what matrimony is? It's when two people are joined in God. 
do you really believe you are capable of bearing the responsibility not only for your own marriage and God, but also on others? I know I am. Can you think of anything of real value that the outsiders have brought with them? Their music? Out you go, Bess McNeil, and be seated. So I realize that this video is already pretty long, and I know that not many people are going to be into that, so I'm going to pass over the last manifesto by Werner Herzog, and instead, in this section, I'm going to give a very brief summary of what I've covered so far, and then offer some sort of unifying criticism of all three movements. So to start the video, I covered Ziga Veritov, a Russian filmmaker who was obsessed with showing the truth on screen. He thought the films of other countries were superficial, not representative of reality. In the second section, I talked about how Stan Brakhage uh, was someone who thought vision and visual perception was an incredibly important but neglected form of communication, especially by his filmmaker peers. He sought to create film that would be an adventure in perception, and he wanted to pursue knowledge via means separate from language, i.e. vision. Lastly, I talked about the Dogma 95 manifesto and subsequent movement. Dogma 95 sought to also convey some sort of truth. They thought that movies of the time were illusory and tried to trick the audience. So they believed that the movie was not an illusion, and so created rules that would force filmmakers in some sense to show the truth without it becoming a genre like everything else was. That said, I think all three of these movements follow the same thread. They are all concerned, at least in some way, with truth and how we perceive or see that truth. Um, I see Vertov's movement and the Dogma 95 movement as largely a progression of a singular idea, with Brackage's focus on vision fitting somewhere in the Dogma movement's idea of film as an illusion. 
I think, however, that ultimately they all fail to really realize the truth of reality in cinema. In the postmodern class, for anyone who was in that, we talked about how everything is eventually integrated into the simulation. If one were to look at the downfall of Dogma 95 in 2002, I think there's a really explicit tie to that idea and the reason they disbanded, which was because the Dogma movement had become a genre in and of itself. It had become the thing it had hoped to be rid of. So, anyway, I think that's all I have for you, and so I'll just wish you all a good rest of the semester.